uh, I just want to say a few words of introduction uh, and welcome everyone who is either in the virtual room or in the physical room uh, to this, the fifth presentation in Westchester University's Spring 2022 Sustainability Research and Practice Seminar. Uh, I'm Brad Flam. I'm the Director of the Office of Sustainability, and we are thrilled to co-sponsor this series with the Office for Research and Sponsored Programs and the Sustainability Council's uh, Scholarly and Creative Activities Committee. Um, we uh, have seven more presentations after this one. Um, so we invite all of you uh, in the audience uh, and our presenter to join us for uh, other presentations this semester. Uh, but for now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Heather Foley. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me OK? You can? OK. So um, I'm Professor Heather Hooley. I'm professor of anthropology in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology, also the department chair. Um, and I'm an archaeologist with a specific training in culture, cultural ecology, human paleoecology, and environmental archaeology. I'm just going to let you know right now that there will be some stray background noise. I'm sitting outside the Wilmington train station because I will be hopping on a train to Rhode Island right away. Um, so I'm working with some colleagues up there and they happen to book me into a really, really tight situation. So, so anyway, just ignore the trucks and motorcycles and stuff like that. It has nothing to do with the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about global cultural heritage um, and drilling down from local heritage concerns to, I mean from global heritage concerns to local heritage concerns given the uh, climate crisis that we are in. According to the United States Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization, we also know as UNESCO, climate change is one of the defining issues of our time. The environmental impacts of climate change is affecting all aspects of life. Um, indeed, according to the International Council on Monuments and Sites, ECOMOS, climate change is one of the fastest growing and significant threats to people and their cultural heritage across the globe. So when I say cultural heritage, I'm talking about things like archaeological sites, historic places, built monuments, uh, cultural landscapes, and all of the intangible cultural meanings that are infused into those places and landscapes. Cultural heritage is our legacy from the past and it informs our lives today. Um, it's an irreplaceable source of cultural knowledge and it's the inspiration that we, uh, that we convey and transmit to future generations. It's a thread that binds us together. Connections to heritage arguably sustains community well-being, and this is really an emphasis that cultural heritage practitioners are making strongly now. Um, and it arguably also builds resiliency for change among human societies. Um, climate change hazards, however, are challenging our understanding of permanence itself. Um, and it's threatening the past that we value and wish to transmit to future generations. Um, UNESCO has convened a working group to address threats from climate change to world heritage properties. These are the world's heritage properties are considered important and iconic places that provide a sense of global heritage and belonging. And as such, these places must meet certain criteria for listing, to be monitored, and for to be protected. Um, so these criteria include outstanding value, meaning this could be a masterpiece, something that's considered a masterpiece of human creativity or bear exceptional testimony of cultural tradition and be an outstanding example of the built environment and human innovation. So under this criteria, masterpiece, exceptional, outstanding are the defining terms. So these places are extremely important, but this listing does not encompass the majority of our cultural heritage the heritage of our everyday lives and our lived experiences. Those places are equally threatened, often, or more so, you can argue, by the effects of climate change and deserve similar concern and attention. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to do a little bit of, um, I'm going to do a little bit of 
changing it up here let's see go back up and what I'm going to do is share uh, some project work that I've been doing with various colleagues both globally and locally so what I'm bringing up right now is um, a story map that was created in um, ArcGIS online and I created this recently for the Society for Historical Archaeology which is an international community of scholars primarily focused on like the colonial world that's not actually my area of emphasis but climate change transcends all time periods and all people so I am involved in this organization through their heritage at risk committee and this story map is a, a case study of climate change impacts across the world and it's something that we're hoping to use as a as a launch pad to build out um, different case studies so you see that we you know you know we mentioned from an archaeological perspective we're concerned globally um, about the impacts and the rate of climate change as it impacts these heritage sites and also the communities that are invested in these heritage places um, if I scroll down here, you'll see what I have here is our actual map tour. This is a map tour that shows places that uh, are featured, that people have contributed their case studies, the work that they're doing in various areas of the world. So we have, for example, Alaska. You know, Alaska and the Arctic region is uh, facing these impacts at an extremely shockingly uh, uh, fast rate. Um, so this project is at the Arctic Circle. It's a community-based coastal observation network. It's all of these projects are community-based. They're grassroots. They involve community engagement. And this is a project where community members are trained to, to take baseline measurements and monitor things like weather, waves, wind, soil, um, and things like that. And so you can see the area of interest shown up here at number one and some of the things that the community's engaged with in terms of monitoring, but also recovering uh, scientific and cultural information before it is destroyed you know, forever. Um, we have several case studies along the East Coast. The East Coast I'll talk about in a little bit, but is experiencing uh, the effects of climate change faster than anywhere else in the United, in, you know, in almost the Northern Hemisphere. Um, and so here we have in Maine, uh, this is an indigenous occupation, indigenous people's occupation. Um, and this shell made in here, you could see the height of it, uh, retains cultural and scientific knowledge and evidence that it covers thousands of years and it's rapidly eroding out um, and will be um, no longer available for people to engage with culturally or scientifically. Again, in Maine, we have this um, schooner. This is a wreck, 145 foot, uh, 560 ton schooner that was submerged um, off of a reef while transporting coal back in the uh, late 19th century. Uh, this schooner is exposed by low tides and then uh, again inundated at high tide, and that tidal action is really. Uh, creating a good deal of instability in terms of the long-term uh, integrity of that particular shipwreck. And this is considered important for our understanding of um, transatlantic trade um, during, the industrial, during the industrialization period. Um, if we go on down, I'm going to skip this because that's my case study. I'll come back to it later. It's in New Jersey. Uh, we have several case studies in um, Florida. And you'll see one here is um, Pocky Island. This is Pocky Island. This is also an indigenous cultural heritage site. It's being uh, battered from both sides, the back marsh and the front coast, um, and is you know eminently in danger of washing out uh, to the sea. Um, let's move on down. And you all are following this, right? You're all, you all are with me on this, seeing everything. And again, similar on the, on the, um, the um, coast of Florida. Down here in the Caribbean, we have a plantation site that's being battered by hurricanes. And the frequency of hurricanes and the intensity of hurricanes is really undermining the integrity of this plantation site. The Society for Black Archaeologists has set up a long-term project here to um, do things like record rising sea levels, take measurements on the effects of earthquakes and hurricanes. 
um, there, this uh, property itself has sustained the most damage or recent damage in the 2018 and 2019 hurricanes. Um, it's a Danish sugar plantation, about 200 acres that housed 141 enslaved Africans. Um, it's currently where the Nature Conservancy of the of the U.S. Virgin Islands has established their headquarters, so they have an archives there um, and other things like that. If we jump over to uh, the other side of the pond, we have up here uh, in the Shetland Islands the site of Fetheland. Um, and this was a fishing community that, again, uh, tells the story of a local tradition that has been, um, that is sustained by a very, in present day times, by a very small community of people who retain that traditional knowledge. Um, so this project is using all kinds of digital modeling, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the effects of that the importance of that. Again, if we're talking about um, industrialization on both sides of the pond, the Brora salt ponds um, is, another, is another location that uh, scientists and uh, preservationists are monitoring the effects of. Let's see, if we go down, what else do we have here? We've got, okay, we've got fortresses in Ireland. You see how close this fortress is to the, to the uh, shoreline here? So in this case, it's the eroding shoreline that is damaging um, this fortress that dates, you know, all the way, that predates, you know, um, the medieval period. Um, what else? Let's see. All right, so, so you'll see that, you know, this is, this is a global concern. Uh, if we look at this, though, we can also see that there's something missing here. I don't know if anybody in the audience wants to chime in what they think is missing from this and what our next steps are um, in addressing these concerns. Anybody from the audience feel like chiming in? See if I can see. Hmm? The representation is all northern hemisphere. There's nothing from the global south, right? And so there's a huge there's a and and this is a this is a real issue um, in getting representation for the global south, who are facing, you know, just as serious threats um, from these different climate impacts. So that is a move that we're working on. Uh, we'll be working on this July with the World Archaeological Congress is to uh, find ways to engage um, with um, our colleagues in the Global South. All right, so I'm going to bring up, did somebody say they had a question? All right. All right. I'm going to change gears here again. Okay. Okay. So I had said that I was not going to share, I was not going to review that one case study from New Jersey because this relates to a project that I'm drilling down to. So we have these global concerns. Um, we talked about, I just mentioned the significance at the local level as well. This story map here illustrates um, a more localized project that's in our backyard practically, down by the Delaware Bay, down by the bay. So you see the title of this story map, Down by the Bay, and the heading, thousands of years, literally 10,000 years or more, of cultural heritage um, is being lost to the similar types of effects. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, I'm going to go our, over our story map and then talk a little bit about the interdisciplinary approach um, that we're taking in this project. So the Delaware Bay is the second largest estuary along the U.S. Atlantic coast. Um, it has some of the largest intact parcels of salt marsh fringing its coastline. This is really significant. The salt marshes are the protective buffers that protect the dry land um, from, 
erosion and inundation from the sea or from the bay in this case. The Delaware Bay wetlands are designated Ramsar wetlands of international importance, so that means they're they produce, um, provide critical habitats for fisheries, for all variety of terrestrial uh, wildlife, migratory sh shorebirds, horseshoe crabs, um, etc. This is one of the largest, uh, one of the most important parts of the Atlantic Flyway for a number of different migratory shorebirds. Uh, these wetlands are large carbon storing ecosystems. So their loss is really important in the whole cycle of global climate change. Um, they filter pollutants from rest runoff, uh, from terrestrial runoff into the water, so they protect the waterways. They buffer the shore from things like erosion, storm surge, tidal inundation, sea level rise, etc. cetera. Uh, for many years, at least up until the last, you know, less than a decade, Cultural preservationists, historians, archaeologists, etc., have sort of written off these intertidal zones as having no resources that are significant for cultural heritage. Um, we've demonstrated through this project that that's not the case at all, in fact. So some of the reasons why this area is um, so challenged is partly due to the topography. A lot of the shoreline is at a meter of uh, an elevation of a meter or less, um, and so therefore, you know, the sea level rise is happening at a pretty quick rate. These um, marshes are being um, lost at approximately an acre per day. Um, so while many places along the Atlantic coast are experiencing high rates of relative sea level rise, higher than the global average, in fact, the Delaware Bay is experiencing some of the gravest and most rapid effects, partly due to the low mean elevation, but also due to the position uh, next to near the um, forebulge of the Laurentide ice sheet. So because of glacial ice melt, uh, it's also exp experiencing this rapid uh, effects from sea level rise. The bay shore encompasses 830 square kilometers of tidal marsh, as I mentioned. They've been forming for the last 2,000 years, um, but now we're seeing tremendous amounts of loss. And here's a, you can see in this image here, uh, the, the sort of dying marsh. You know, this marsh is being essentially um, converted into mud flats. So we use, I'll talk a little bit more, we use in our project models from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They just produced their most recent report, the sixth assessment report just came out, hot off the press in fact. Our models use this IPPC approach, which is based on um, different gas emission scenarios, greenhouse gases. And so you can see here that we have the bay shoreline we have modeled at 20, every decade almost. We, we could model it every decade. It's just a tremendous amount of work to do this. But we have 2030, 2050, 2080, 2100, the relative sea level rise along the bay. And when we show here, we're showing low probability on the far left, low probability. Low probability means that we make tremendous amount of changes that will impact the amount of gas emissions in the atmosphere. Uh, we have intermediate probability scenarios right here. And then on the far right, we have the high probability scenario. High probability does not mean it's the most likely to happen or the highest probability. It means that it has the highest impact of change. And this is basically if we go along business as usual and there's no alteration in gas emissions into the atmosphere. So you can see there's there's actually decision and you know according to use, using these IPPC models there's this human behavior has a significant impact on the outcomes. Um, so here we show I'm showing uh, one of our case studies along um, New Jersey. This is the East Point Peninsula. It the lighthouse right here, if you can see my cursor, is one of the defining characteristics of this landform, but this landform has been inhabited by 10, 000, at least 10,000 years. And we see the different scenario outcomes, um, low, high, and medium of this landscape um, 
depending on you know the gas emission situation. Down here in Lewis, we have early Dutch whaling communities, early Dutch colonial settlements, and again, similar differences in outcomes to that landform. Cape May, most people are familiar with Cape May, right across the bay. Um, so I'm gonna stop here. Oh, okay, I'm gonna show you this, our heat map here. So all of the known documented cultural resources overlaying with our, um, with our sea level rise scenarios. So you can see that there's a tremendous amount of cultural heritage in that in this region. I'm going to come back to this. Okay. So the story maps are are attempts at making what we're working on um, friendly to the public, right? Doing scientific research and doing, you know, cultural studies is very important, but it really needs to be engaging to the public. It's the public who has, meaning, you know, non-researchers, anybody who's interested, has the ability to um, make changes and to leverage their interests. Uh, let me just go back for a second. So the Delaware Bay Climate and Archaeology Project is how we've been doing our work. We established this in 2017. We've been able to keep it going, keep it alive with funding from the Westchester University Foundation, the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and um, National Geographic Society. And you see here we are on this map. Um, in the Delaware Bay area with these rates of sea level rise being the hot spot right up in this Bay area. So the objectives of this project have been to develop models for examining the climate change threats to cultural resources in the intertidal zone of the Bay, particularly with an emphasis on sea level rise, storm surges, coastal erosion, and salt marsh disintegration. For the storm surge, we've collaborated. This is an interdisciplinary project. I'm co-PI with Dr. Nicotina from the Department of Earth and Space Sciences, and we've had guest uh, scholarship by Dr. Yunhun Kim from the Department of Earth and Space Sciences and Dr. Megan Heckert from the Department of Geography and Planning. Um, so here to model and look at the effects of sto storm sur surge, we've applied the simulation model called the Sea, Lake, and Overland Surges from Hurricanes, or SLOSH model simulation. Sea level rise, this is our actual data that we converted into the story map I showed you. You see all of these different sites, locations in green, cultural heritage places in green. The red ones are going to be, are threatened. Sea level rise using the IPPC gas emission scenarios that I talked about. And then marsh disintegration. So you see what we have here are these ponds that over we've been monitoring uh, with groundwater um, monitoring wells. And what we see is that over the course of season, a uh, couple of seasons, they are both growing. These ponds are both growing. And the smaller ones are, are joining together to form bigger ones. So what this is telling us is that the marsh is being converted into open water. All of this is done with students, undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and we work with students in f doing field work, doing lab work, um, students from archaeology, geology, geography, and biology have been involved in the project um, in all phases. The interdisciplinary approach that we take, in addition to these modeling that I've just talk, discussed, involves um, a tremendous amount of GIS work, archaeological survey, drone flyovers, LIDAR or light detected image, radar imaging, um, marsh sediment collection, shoreline monitoring, um, etc. Every summer we run our field program. Um, students can uh, register for this, they get course credit for it, um, and they spend about four and a half weeks um, intensely engaged in 
um, doing field work with us. Um, so in general, the work that we've been doing indicates that despite what seems like a relative uh, homogeneity of the surface topography, it's all about one meter or less, that the impacts that we're seeing from climate change and that we can predict to see from climate change um, are, qu are surprisingly variable. Um, and in large part, this is due to the ancestral landscape uh, as well as human activities. Um, we consider nature-based remediation programs to be uh, the most sustainable mitigation strategies. This includes things like ditch remediation, uh, marsh restoration, and living shore, the construction of living shorelines. There are a couple of these projects already going on and, or being piloted in the Delaware Bay region. One of these is with the Delaware Center for the Estuary. Um, and the Delaware Center for the Inland Bays. This one I'm showing right now involves ditch remediation. So all throughout the works project administration as a way to put people to work, the federal government employed people to go out into these marshes and, and ditch them. And the idea was that they were going to be um, um, managing mosquito populations. In fact, the opposite happened and the mosquito populations got work got worse because of this. So ditch remediation involves a multi-year process of, of infilling these ditches. It's a very complicated um, procedure, throwing in or uh, building up um, the natural uh, vegetation over time. And you can see over a three-year period the difference that it can make in um, restoring the health of these marshes. Um, let's see, next. Okay, here we go. Um, another project is being under or has been undertaken by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, Agency. This is a, the largest marsh restoration project to date, and it's taken place at the Prime Hook National Wildlife, Ref, Wildlife Refuge in uh, Delaware. And you can see here that this marsh has been was blown out, mostly due to storm surge and hurricanes. And the project down here involves uh, rebuilding the marsh with the um, natural vegetation. Again, a uh, somewhat long-term undertaking and quite expensive for that matter. Uh, this project is one of my favorites, the Give a Shuck project, this oyster shell recycling program, which is uh, being undertaken by the um, Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. And this involves constructing artificial reefs uh, using things like native wetland plants, natural structures, recycling shellfish, primarily oyster. They'll go around to restaurants. Restaurants will donate, um, you know, all of their cast off oyster shells and then use that to build these artificial um, reef structures to protect the shoreline and the back area. Um, another one here, this is our project area that I showed you, the one that was the lighthouse with the 10,000 year old settlement area. Um, and this was, was undertaken by the American Littoral Society. Uh, this one has been problematic. This is not using all, you know, like a nature based, this one in the bottom left is not using a nature based um, strategy. It's putting in this artificial geotubing. Um, after going back and seeing the artificial geotubing completed, um, it's clear that there are definite problems for this that affect wildlife. Horseshoe crabs are a very important resource to this area, um, and they, when they um, make their way to shore, they find themselves trapped behind that geotubing, and we saw literally hundreds of them trapped and dying behind that geotubing. So this is not, the bottom left is not um, what we would consider to be a sustainable um, compared to the other ones I just mentioned. Sometimes these uh, places we just have to find ways to say goodbye to important cultural places um, because of loss is just unavoidable. So we've undertaken in such case, uh, we're starting to undertake I should say in such case digital forms of preservation that include things like 3D photogrammetry, drone flyover. So the bottom right was like our first drone flyover. It's kind of like not that, it's not that, uh, it's not that pretty. We've done better since our subsequent drone flyovers um, but to, and 3D GIS. Um, and so then these are ways to, again, sustainably um, preserve the cultural heritage that we wish to have for future generations, just in a different format. 
and again, whoops, I'm sorry. And then this, these are all projects undertaken by students, everyone that I've shown you. This right here is a 3D GIS project. It's the first one that we've done, that we did. This is student driven. Um, we need to go back to, with this student and slow this uh, simulation down. Um, but otherwise you can see the shoreline spinning around, the dune system that is barely even there, and then um, um, a structure here that houses, it's a, um, I'll stop. It's a curation facility that houses cultural materials. Um, it's like a spillover um, curation facility for the museums down in Delaware. So all of the materials that are that are being stored there are are at threat. They need to be moved um, unless there's some sort of remediation strategy for building up that dune and protecting um, the landscape behind it. Um, so I'd like to see if there are any questions from anybody out there in the virtual or physical audience. Um, one of the things that I think I'd like to emphasize in closing is that, you know, I'm an archaeologist and a lot of people really think that the archaeologists work in the past. We work for the past, but m just as much, if not more so, uh, than more than many other sciences, we're working for the future, for the future of our cultural heritage, for the future of our legacy, um, and our shared, um, you know, cultural resources. And that's the reason for undertaking this work. If we were working for the past, we would just let it. We wouldn't care, and we would just let it all go away. Thank you very much. Um, I think we probably have some questions here, but if someone in the Zoom room would like to... Or chat. First, chat is fine too. Well, I, I have kind of a, I think it's a big picture question. Are the challenges that you've been describing in this presentation today an exacerbation of problems that always exist, or is climate change causing entirely new problems for archaeology it's creating it's doing both so we know that climates have changed throughout the past i mean we have a long-term record of human environmental interactions you know we have an archaeological evidence of people you know facing drought at you know ad 1200 and all sorts of other uh, climate events and climate trends. We know that climate has changed throughout time, but what's happening now is new. It's creating a whole new set of challenges in terms of the rate is just become, it's very alarming. And the rate is making us de decide how do we, what do we do here? If not all of our human cultural heritage can be salvaged, how do we decide what's important. That's the big challenge. And that's why we have to engage with communities because communities say what's important, right? So that, that's, that's really what's made it so different. I mean, we have to find new ways of salvaging quickly. Um, in, and if we are salvaging quickly, uh, what are we gonna do with the materials that we're salvaging? I mean, are we going to put it in a museum? And if we do, museums are going to be, they're already in crisis. There's no space for all kinds of new, you know, uh, materials. So it really has to be, there's a lot of thought and collaboration that, that we need to get our head around, around doing. Yep, thanks for that question, Brad. And if I can just follow up with the question. Do you think that archaeologists have traditionally been trained in those kinds of community engagement skills? Because I, I would imagine that it's pushing you to develop skills that might not have been part of your toolkit in the past. So two things are different. One is that professionally, it's been part of our professional ethics to preserve in place to not go digging stuff up, right? Because once we do, it, it, we never, it never goes back, right? So our, our professional ethics guides us to like test, find out, do as little invasive work as we can to find out what we need, 
and now the and now it's a new challenge well if we do that we'll we may be sacrificed We may be sacrificing our ability to learn in the future because we will have lost that opportunity. So it's challenging us to rethink our, our ethics about preservation in place. But in terms of what you asked about communication, um, more or less, I mean, so archaeologists have really always engaged with the public in one way or another. What it's challenging us to do is rethink how we do it and who it's for. Um, so I'll give you an example. I'm working on a project with this same, the Heritage at Risk group to examine our own language. Actually, I have a student working on this for her senior project. So we have these blogs and she's taking all of our blogs and she's running it through like word clouds and she's examining it for jargon and um, her her purpose or her goal is to see ways in which communication is just falling short where, where we really think we're talking to the public and communicating to the public but what we're doing actually is just talking to ourselves again you know so she's gonna she's examining like the language that we use we take things for granted like when I say cultural heritage I take it for granted that people know what I mean what I mean is really pretty broad. I mean, there's intangible cultural heritage that we include in there as well, but we don't necessarily make that explicit. So it's it's really not that we have to reach, not that we have to get out of our comfort zone in engaging with the public, it's, it's rethinking our communication style. Yeah, of course, just following up, <clears throat> yeah, I was thinking the phrase salvage operation kept going through my mind and you guys used that phrase. Um, so does this involve, this crisis involve a, a wholesale shift in the field towards prioritizing coastline sites now? No, that's, I'm glad you asked that. I'm presenting coastline stuff because I'm a coastline person. However, one of my best friends is a mountain person and so she's seeing all sorts of things like mass wasting, you know, through like landslides and mudslides and then, you know, forest fires that are out of control. So it's and drought in, you know, other places um, that is being exacerbated through, you know, the effects of climate change. So that's another thing in terms of our map tour that I presented. The big one is that it's very coastal focused and not only do we want to expand to engage with the global south, our colleagues in the global south, but we want to represent those interior threats that are just as just as significant and alarming as the coastal threats. So it just so happens that I'm doing coastal stuff. I, I we, we're, we're, not all of us are. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people make analogies for good reason between the archaeology and paleontology. And a lot of paleontology I thought of as salvage operations anyway, because um, you, we're usually digging in erosive services that from season to season change, and there can be a lot of data loss. And it, it, sometimes it's just uh, hit or miss or matter of luck, even though you, you focus on areas that are particular deposition type and time period. So one of the things about the, salve, the the concept of doing salvage is that it really comes back to community. So, I mean, I have engagements with various, a few different tribal communities, Native American tribal communities. And some, and it's so diverse, the responses are so diverse, just as they would be with any population. Some communities say this is really our, a landscape that is sacred and important to us and we it's not the, the stuff it's the land right and we value that land that landscape other communities will say this is the course of nature nature gives and nature takes and it's going to go away so you know that's where engaging with the communities is really is really key You mentioned that you wanted to engage more with the global south. Oh, hey, Dr. Cooley. Hi. Hi. 
Yeah, I'm not in your class right now because I know you're not going to be in my class because I'm going to be on a train to Rhode Island pretty soon. <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, I've been to the Wilmington train station, and it's it's not that great of a place to be doing a Zoom call. I wouldn't so do I it. In, I would do it in, but they make you wear masks still, and I didn't want to present with a mask on. Yeah, understandably. Um, so my question is, what is being done to engage uh, with you know other groups in different countries? And such. I know you said there was like a, a need to um, work with uh, the global south, but it seems like there's a lot of communities uh, that probably would be very welcoming. Um, so, like, what is being done? So, what's being done immediately is in July, there's a meeting in uh, the Czech Republic of the World Archaeological Congress, and this is a, a world organization that. Um, purposefully engages with the global south. Um, we have set up a convening of interested scholars to come together to talk through, from the global north and the global south, to talk through, um, to share information, to share concerns, to, to share knowledge. Um, I have worked with some colleagues um, from Latin America, and one of the things that the you know, the convener of the World Archaeological Congress has said is that this is a this is a, um, a significant issue for many people in the global south, but in some cases there are just other priorities that like economic health or in some cases, you know, internal, you know, conflict and strife, things that just seem to go to the top of the list and keep pushing the climate change down. And in other instances, there are um, communities of scholars that just don't have the same types of resources that we have in the global north to do the work. So we have through the, the World Archaeological Congress something that's called Archaeologists Without Borders and it's to visit and to do things like set up lecture series and you know give pro bono of our time um, and resources to um, colleagues that don't have the same resources that we do. One more question here, if you have, have uh, yep. time before yep. your train. Yep. Hello. Hi. Uh, I, uh, I was just curious, I <clears throat> noticed uh, just some of the pictures from earlier the presentations. Uh, do you have the opportunity to do field work with your students? Uh, as, as like been integrated in the classes that you teach curious. all the time nice. so students uh, do they students can students can join in students can be a part of this so they can get they can go in the field with us in the summer like this summer we'll be out in the field May 16th through June 17th we have space for graduate and undergraduate students. We have students from other universities come as well. Um, and then the people who are engaged in this interdisciplinary project will incorporate um, different par facets of this work into traditional coursework, like classroom coursework. So students can continue to, if they do field work with us and they really like a certain aspect of it or they want to do their senior project on some aspect of it, they can keep working with us. I mean, this project would not be possible without students. Definitely. Well, we're, we're, almost, we're almost at 12.50, um, so we don't want to keep you from uh, your train. Okay. Um, but um, a quick uh, round of applause for both of us. Oh, and by the way, this is one of the areas where we work behind us. That's that's our that's our environment, the intertidal zone. That's one of our project areas. Thank you so much for making time and for doing this. Um, sure. You know, sure. it it what um, might be less than ideal circumstances outside the uh, Wilmington train station. That's okay. It worked. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Bye. Goodbye.